Hello, everyone. Are we are we on with audio? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much to everyone online. We always thought online first, just say thank you so much for joining us. Sorry that we're a little bit late. We had a bit of a delay with um, moving from the auditorium to this room. So very much uh, appreciate that you join us and uh, looking forward to you all uh, being here. I just wanted to start with online first. They always get a little extra because they're online. Um, and hello to everyone in the room. It's such a pleasure to have you all here. We really appreciate as well the time that you've taken to come talk to us. And I hope there'll be lots of time for some questions um, and discussion in between the different presentations. So we'll try not to pack it in too much, but we have started a little bit late. So we will do our best to catch up. Um, my name before the alarm. Yes, thank you for saying that. So very exciting for all that don't know Norway. There is a, a national uh, alarm system going off across the entire country today, which usually warns us if there's something bad going to happen, this is where now we need to go downstairs and uh, in the basement. Um, and today, even worse, what they are uh, testing is a new system, which means that our phones are also, if they're connected to the network, they're also going to start um, an alarm. So we will try to end by 10 to 12 so that we can experience that experience outside of this room and not online. And I hope you don't get to experience that for you online. Um, so my name is uh, Sofia Koziakis. I'm the EMIS project manager, uh, manager working at the University of Oslo. I work in a, a really beautiful team of many, many, many people. I said earlier in, in the plenary session, it takes a village uh, to learn what it is about educa the education sector that DHIS2 and the HISP network and all that we've learned is able to contribute with. Um, I wanted to start by saying that we have six partner countries who have come along a long journey with us. Those countries are the Gambia, where we have aggregates and tracker data that's being explored. We have um, Togo, Uganda, Mozambique, Eswatini, and Sri Lanka. And there really is some growing interest from many countries reaching out to understand either how DHIS2 can be leveraged as a full national scale system um, for their, their EMIS or how it can complement uh, existing systems. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through um, all the, the list here because you will be able to get the slides. But I just want to highlight that the education sector has really two broad data challenges. One is the availability of data. We have lots and lots and lots of data, but we're not using it quickly enough and timely enough to be able to respond where it matters. We're also not maybe visualizing it in a way that makes good sense, where we can respond and look at things in comparison to one another. And then very importantly, and maybe the most difficult is the data use. So we've been as a team trying to pluck up all those data use stories as much as we can, no matter how small they are. To us, there are gold little nuggets to see that how we can start to learn from each other and continue that, that journey. Um, another thing I really want to um, highlight is integration with existing systems. So DHIS2's approach is not to come in and take away completely another system, but rather to see how we can play well with that system. So we know that for many years, there might be capacity that's built up in a different system. Many, many people within the ecosystem understand it and use it as maybe a data collection tool, but maybe it has a little gap and that might be analyzing that data. And we can even analyze that data over many, many, many years. So in Togo right now, we have legacy data from the year 2000, which has been all the way transported into DHS2, so you can see those trends. I'm going on too long. We don't have time. Let me stop. There's so many cool things to talk about, so I need to stop. Um, I just want to highlight the university collaborations. You can see here on the screen, we've got the University of Gam the Gambia. Some really beautiful work starting to happen there, and I hope that by the next annual conference, we'll have even more to share. Grant, how do I move to the next slide? Click. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, there. Thanks, everyone. I was liking seeing everyone. I'm going to pass it over to um, Tadia Sonmid, who is the associate professor here, uh, an associate professor here at the University of Oslo. He's working very closely with PhD and master students that are part of the DHS2 for Education project. 
I just wanted to emphasize by the slide by saying that we really are working as much as we can closely with PhD candidates. Uh, we're lucky to have Sidi Ahmed Jallo in the room with us today. He is from the Ministry of Education in the Gambia, but also a PhD candidate. So having, having that power of, of being able to see what your empirical country in the flesh and also decide what your focus is based on policy directives within a country really makes for a special mix of, um, of reflection, per perhaps for for CD himself as an individual for his country, and then also he can share with other countries as well, which is very powerful. So Teddy, I pass it over to you. And unfortunately I left the very fancy diagram, which we said we maybe mustn't, but uh, you can use this mic if you would like, just come a bit closer. Okay. Morning, I'm Tadia. So <laughs> I can, I could do this without the slide, but we can, we can, interact a bit with the slide. I just want to, um, since, since you, my colleagues covered so well why education, I think I could, I wanted to reflect a bit on why us <laughs> into education. And I think that is because we have a digital platform ecosystem. So I'll, I'll try to reflect a bit upon what, what I mean by that. So, I mean, there are many, many softwares already in the education sector. Some of them actually catering specifically to education management information systems, just like this has to help build its success around supporting HMIS or health information system strengthening. But uh, if, you, if you look at the initiatives, they have also existed uh, a few of them for quite a few years, but they haven't really built an ecosystem around. So, so there are products, software products, and today it's also nice to, when you have a software product to refer to it as a platform. So you have, a product, software code, and then you slap open APIs on top of it, and then you say you have a platform. But you don't necessarily have an ecosystem on, around that platform. And then it doesn't really matter whether you have open APIs. If nobody is really interacting with the APIs, building extensions, building capacity around it. So I think that's that's the big difference. And then the question is, uh, for other actors, you know, how, how do you replicate that. And uh, I think my my view on that is that that is not so easy. There isn't any quick fix. For software, there are quick fixes. You can fork DHS2 and then you have a nice, you know, uh, platform to start with, but it's just, a, it's just a technical. You can't, you know, copy paste the community and the, and the, and the capacity in countries. And, and that's, I think, is the, is the challenge, right? So like Sophia said, we work with universities now moving into education to build exactly the same capacity that Jörn and others started with very, very long ago in, in health, right? To build these collaborations between universities and ministries to meet national needs and to build that around a particular design. And that is the DHS2 artifact, the platform. So. If you think of it, I, I think there is this, um, you know, growing gap potentially between the sign and, and use and the community is there to fill that gap. Because if you have a hammer, it has very obvious uses and you don't really need many people to figure out what the uses are. It's basically for hitting nails and pulling them out again. But when you have something complex like DHS2, it can be configured, extended to all kinds of use cases, like they say all kinds of purposes. And you need a whole community to be able to identify the possible uses, right? The, to come up with value propositions, to say, hey, DHS2 can be used for this, but it can also be used for this. And we are using it for this, maybe you can also do that. Um, and, and I think that's, that's the challenging part that we have a, a software that is growing in complexity and it's growing in terms of number of and heterogeneity of use cases and users. So then why would we also make it more complicated by moving into education? I think uh, Kirsten used the term spillover, I think in the plenary, we see that we have succeeded in building this ecosystem around DHS2 in terms of capacity and, um, and community. And that is incredibly hard. And then we see that there is a potential spillover into education where that has not really happened. So you have great software, but you don't have these communities like ours. And I mean, this whole conference is a good testimony to the community part, right? That we have a strong community that can actually take this tool and transform it into useful things in, in many different settings. So I think that's, that's what I wanted to say. And then, I mean, 
this this uh, I, I said this about design and use, right? So the more uh, different use cases, the more we need to translate them and, and configure the chance to, to meet them. But there are many strong similarities to education. Uh, even if on the ground, the service provision is very different from health. I think when you look at the ministries, how they're set up and what kind of indicators they're looking at and, and how they need to, to act on data, things are very similar. So we have a lot of knowledge in countries within the Ministry of Health. Uh, it was also mentioned in the plenary that you know Ministry of Health could be part of helping out training Ministry of Education, which is a great situation. Uh, and of course, this, uh, since we have some lack of standard in our industry, often software products drive the innovations and then standards come afterwards. And since there isn't too many standards, there are some great synergies across sectors by using the same platform because then you have interoperability already and you can exchange data between health and education and other sectors. So just to, I just wanted to share this idea that you know what we have is an ecosystem and that makes this very valuable. And it's possible of course to learn from it, but I think there is no quick fix in kind of copying an ecosystem. And that's why we should move into and support education because we have the capacity and the community to do so. I think my colleagues sold very good, very well the case that something is needed in education, but I think this is why we should we should do it. And uh, this figure is actually from a paper that the team wrote together. It's in this is a gem background paper, so that's as I understand it, kind of a a bible for education folks interested in technology and and other things. So it's it's we're trying to share this idea because we don't need to be the only actor, obviously, in this space. Uh, other, others can learn from, from our community, potentially. I think that's what I wanted to say. Of course, we are working then in our project in all of these dimensions. I mean, we are informing the software, listening to country requirements, and trying to inform the further development of DHS2, now also listening to education sector needs without making it too complicated, because we don't want to break DHS2 with with all kinds of requirements, right? That's important. And we're also building capacity, like Sophia said, I'm, I'm leading the collaboration with the University of the Gambia to try to come up with a master program and a diploma program to create a new cadre of, of uh, experts that can you know, spearhead these chance to into education and meet the country capacity needs. And of course, the community, we are also making strides to, to build a community around education. And I guess you're all kind of candidates are already part of that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teria. Um, I think this was important to emphasize because we are working within this ecosystem. It's not just the software product, but it's all of these, uh, all of the comprising parts that are helping us to learn and, and move the way forward. So really thank you for that. Um, I would now like to cross it over. I'm just making sure that everyone online can hear me. Um, Mr. Luke Manjaji from the African Union IPED has joined us. And um, I'm just making sure, Jaji, that you can hear us and that the audio is working. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Sophia. I hear you loud and clear. Let me, can you please confirm if you can hear me? Uh, just one second. We're just checking because the audio is not coming through here. Can you hear me? Hello? Sorry for that. We are just testing the audio. Maybe I can do a very quick introduction. So Mr. Luke Manjaji is working for the African Union IPED, as I mentioned, that's actually a very important body who is focusing on, um, has EMIS mandates. And I think a very important part of um, Mr. Jaji and the team's work is working together with member states on a set of EMIS norms and standards. Um, and we really wanted to frame the discussion before we go into any more um, examples about what we're doing within the important framework that helps us to see how are different countries doing in terms of what should be an EMIS norm and standard. 
And I think something that's very important that he will speak to as well is how this has been um, a country-led led endeavor. So sorry for that, but uh, Mr. Lugman Jaji, are you able to hear us and can we hear you now? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Uh, please confirm if you can hear me. We can't hear you, so sorry. We are just... Uh... Uh, it seems the colleagues no, online he's, can he's hear me. Definitely, uh, um... I can read a clock message saying that, that they can hear me online. It's such a pity. Um... Up the audio. Yeah. Okay, we're going to do that. So sorry for that. Thank right, you for okay. confirming you can hear us. We just can't hear you. So we're getting one more solution down. Apologies for that. Yeah. Okay. No. We are now able to hear you. So Excellent. Please go ahead. Welcome. Excellent. Can you hear me now? Thank you very much, uh, Sophia. Thank you very much, Deji, for. Uh, for the introduction, uh, my name is Lukman, Lukman Jaji. I'm working for the African Union. Um, I lead the work of the African Union on uh, education data systems and EMEs in general. Um, I am responsible for uh, working with uh, 55 member states to support uh, uh, the capacity improvements uh, of uh, national data production processes as well as usage as well. Uh, and of course, this of course entails uh, uh, a lot of things. Can you hear me, please? Yes, we can hear you. Just a little bit low, but we're. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Yeah. So, um, so I'll proceed with my presentation this morning. I'll be speaking briefly, uh, for about ten minutes or so about the AU image norms and standards. Uh, so I'll be speaking about the AU image norms and standards, uh, and uh, the key messages I would like to just, uh, 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 like a summary of my presentation, we'll be focusing just on three things uh, to inform you that the AU image norms and standards uh, uh, serves as the premier image capacity assessment tool for our, for our member states. Uh, 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 this is what they'll be using to conduct self-assessment, uh, uh, as well as uh, for, for conducting peer reviews as well. Uh, I wouldn't want to go into the history of how we came about the document, how the regional, the regional community communities themselves now have their own uh, uh, norms and standards. Uh, the AU piloted this uh, uh, instrument within the SADC and instructed every other region to develop uh, a norms and standards. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long history, but I wouldn't want to uh, go into, uh, into that now. Uh, so the tool, of course, is used for capacity assessment at the national level and also for peer reviews. Uh, I'll be speaking briefly about our, our endeavor last week in Lesotho, where we just conducted a, uh, a fantastic uh, peer review exercise. Uh, it was a learning experience for everyone involved. Uh, as well, it also spells out, the, the tool itself spells out the legal, the technical, and the policy level direction uh, that a country is expected to take uh, to ensure that we have a functional image system. Image system is one thing, is it functional, uh, which means does it respond to national need? and does it respond to uh, uh, the needs and demands of, of, of development partners as well. So these are the three key messages of my... Of Have we lost audio? Uh, you can see the norms and standards itself has about four standards and 15 norms. Uh, and you can see it has the, 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 the standard on, on the policy and legal framework, uh, of, of EMIS or and the national data production processes. Uh, it talks also about resource availability. It talks about statistical processes and it also talks about education information reporting. So in all of this, then you have uh, uh, all of these uh, uh, five standards I shared between, for example, the Directorate of Planning, the Statistics Unit and the ICT Unit. Uh, in some cases, this uh, uh, department or this unit have to interface with other are quite important units outside uh, of the Directorate of Planning, but this, these are the norms and standards that this document spells out. Uh, you can see them, there is the mandate, which is all, all very legal. Uh, there is the quality commitment, there is the statistical confidentiality. Some of these policy frameworks, for example, have to interface with, uh, with existing national frameworks. For example, the Statistical Act, uh, for example, if it exists. Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, these interfaces have to 
uh, uh, sorry, these uh, uh, legal frameworks have to interface with, for example, the image policy uh, and, and all of the other documents that are available. And then you also have uh, around resources, you know, how is it funded? You know, how, how what is the percentage of the, uh, of the ministry's budget, for example, that goes into data production, that goes into ICT, uh, uh, basically just availability of resources. And then there is the statistical processes. Statistical processes spells out how data is collected, who supplies the data, how it is transported, what are the procedures that are uh, uh, that the ministry, for example, applies in this process, uh, and then is there a burden on respondents? Does one school or one data production uh, a unit or, or hub or node have to produce more data than others? All of these things are what we score between zero to four. I will, I will get to that in a minute. And then you also have the reporting. When you collect data from people, what do you do with the data? Do you just keep it or do you just make your own decisions at a level? In some cases, there should be that feedback to the schools and to others to understand why they are producing, why they are even giving you data in the first place. Accuracy and reliability, timeliness and punctuality, coherence, consistency, and, and, and all of that, comparability. So these, these, are, these are just basically what the entire document entails. Uh, I could share with uh, the latest version uh, to the Secretariat if anyone is interested in having a copy of it. Uh, I think uh, we will make that commitment to share with, 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 with everyone. Um, how do we do this? What is our approach? How is this document used uh, by our countries? Like I mentioned uh, about a, a year and a half ago, our countries conducted some training. We did conduct some trainings for them on how to use this tool uh, to conduct self-assessment. And we even gave them certificates for it, uh, which means they not only can self-assess themselves, they, are, they can also act as peer reviewers uh, to, to other countries. Uh, so uh, we also have facilitation by the RECs. The RECs are a very, very important uh, uh, element in this process because uh, uh, we are, we, when we conduct peer review exercises, we like to use countries within the same REC because of you know, shared experiences, uh, because there could be easy, you know, easy knowledge transfer and peer learning uh, could occur. We also have in-country visits where the African Union and some development partners do visit the countries and perhaps just interview them or have some questions on, on a particular norms uh, or, or standards. In like, for example, the one we had in Lesotho. Uh, then there are also questionnaires. So I have to go back a little bit. Questionnaires are developed against each of these norms. You have just very short, like in Lesotho, we had a questionnaire of 10 questions against each of the norm, uh, where then we, we meet with the exams and records, or we are meeting with the planners or the statisticians or the IT team or the, you know, or the, or the policy level or policy makers within the ministry. So we develop uh, uh, questionnaires against each of these. Uh, and then uh, we also have interviews where we score them based on zero to four. So we score them, you know, what, what do you think? Where would you score yourself in this? In fact, when Lesotho conducted the first self-assessment in 2021, uh, before we arrived to the country to conduct actually a field uh, uh, peer review with other member states, they had to take the exam again, they said, and they scored themselves about 25% lower than they scored themselves in 2021, which means there were changes you know, in IT, there were changes in policy, there were changes in human resource, there were changes in finances as well. So they thought while they were doing better in 2021, in 2023, when they took the assessment again, they scored themselves, you know, quite, you know, quite a, a significant uh, a point uh, lower than, than they had done before. So the coverage of this, this covers all of the uh, regions of Africa. ECOWAS does have a regional uh, emis norms and standards. And the reason why they all have regional norms and standards is because when the AU conceived the idea to develop this uh, 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 framework, we uh, uh, reached out to the regions themselves to also, I uh, know we piloted this first at SADC. Uh, we piloted this at SADC and then even encouraged this to be developed at other, uh, other regional economic communities as well. So the, it, it, it covers the entire, uh, 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 the entire uh, uh, regions of the continent. So uh, before I go to the next slide, which happens, looks like it may be my, uh, my last slide, I want to briefly speak about, uh, if time permits me, to speak about the, our Lesotho experience. Uh, what we found out in Lesotho is that there is, uh, uh, we now quite understand better when they say a country does not have, or a country is not able to produce data. We know what it means when they cannot produce data. When we think it's IT sometimes, sometimes it's not IT. When we think it's policy, sometimes it's not policy. When we think it's resources, human resources and all of that, we, we fact, when you see a blank on, in front of an indicator of an African country on U.S. website, there are so many conditions, there are so many 
uh, uh, reasons why that could be. And pa pa this peer review exercise really exposed us uh, uh, to, to that. Uh, we looked at, uh, for example, now uh, I'll give you an example on the IT side since we are speaking about DHIS. Um, Lesotho is known to be using the open image system from, from UNESCO. And they gave quite a lot of reasons why that system was not working. But from our assessment, I can categorically tell you that even if they get a new system right now, it's going to have the same fate. It may fail as well. So there are so many policy level, human resource, infrastructure issues that needed to be addressed before uh, 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 a technology solution is deployed because it may suffer uh, the same fate. And uh, we've heard very well uh, from the minister himself and from the, uh, from the deputy permanent secretary that they are migrating to DHIS. And our own call to them as the AUC was that please before DHIS is finally deployed or you can make it a complete package to fix your infrastructure needs, to fix uh, uh, some, some, some uh, uh, alignment to statistical act, who produces data, who is mandated to produce data so that you don't just have a fantastic system, but then it's empty, it doesn't receive data because all of these bottlenecks are there. I, I could go on and on about decluttering ministries of education in order to be able to produce uh, uh, effective data. But that's, uh, that's just, uh, yeah, uh, just, just uh, a few points I wanted to make. And then what are, what are the output and out, uh, expected outcomes of using the norms and standards? Uh, of course, the output would be that uh, we produce a report at the end of the day of our experiences. I hope to share this report with uh, Sophia when it's available so that she can share with the rest of the team. Uh, we are waiting for Lesotho to clear it and to give us the go ahead and it's shareable uh, to the public. Uh, but it's a fantastic report for anyone who really wants to understand uh, the business of data production in country. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the roadmap uh, to address the gaps, you know, what are the priority areas, long term, short term, medium term, uh, uh, low hanging fruit, quick wins that the countries could quickly fix uh, 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 to, to ensure that they are <clears throat> their system is functional. The expected outcomes, of course, we want to ensure that countries are able to produce quality data. It's very, very important that countries are able to produce quality data. I'll give you an example. The, 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 I, uh, the planner, the director of planning told us that she knows very well that enrollment, for example, is reducing. She can tell that enrollment is reducing, but they don't have the data to back it up. She said they don't even know how to collect the data to buy, but they can tell that it's improving. And for example, they, there are so many things that they feel at the ministry is, 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 a, is a particular way, but the data is not actually there to whether I convince the Ministry of Finance to, you know, to increase the funding to the ministry or all that. So quality statistics is very important. Then there's peer learning. Peer learning, not just from country to country, but even from ministry, within the ministry itself, there could be a lot of peer learning and exchanges that could occur. You will find out that in some countries, they have not even had a departmental meeting within the Directorate of Planning for three years. All these things are not even technology related. It's just social issues that are blocking uh, uh, the production of data. Um, I think this is my last slide and I do uh, hope that uh, I've, been, I've been able to at least uh, uh, expose you a little bit to what the norms and standards is all about. Uh, I'm available for questioning and uh, comments uh, as the proceedings uh, go on. Thank you very much, Sophie. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Lukman. I really, we really appreciate this. I think it's so important for, for us as a team, as we move into the space to understand what are the frameworks that are there? What are the, the norms and standards that exist? And especially there is absolutely, like, like we said before, golden nuggets within this peer learning, within these outcomes um, that we can can look at what has already been done in country and see if there's areas we can work together with the country to to frame our, ourselves. So I re we really appreciate you you being here for taking the time and I'm not sure if there's any particular questions right now uh, for Lukman. If not, we can also keep them until towards the end. Thank you so much. Ah, you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Looking forward to to talking more. Thank you very much. No problem. Wonderful. So now we are moving on. on. I've got put on mute. Sorry. We're moving on to our next colleague. Um, we've been speaking a lot about local innovations. We, Tadia was showing us the diagram where we saw you've got DHIS2 as this architecture platform. Uh, we've got applications that exist within it already, but there's this element of being able to be a bit flexible. So if we see something unique in the education space, how are we able to respond to that specific use case? 
So we thought it would be a really exciting moment to take a bit of time with Sidi, Jalo, Sidi Ahmed Jalo from the Ministry of Education Gambia, also a PhD student has mentioned, who's going to talk a little bit more about this journey that they've been on with daily attendance um, in the Gambia. So I am going to go back to the presentation and Sidi, please feel free to come join us. And I think you can uh, use the mic over here. My pleasure. Thank you. to um, project back in the Gambia and um, is primarily focusing on trying to make sure that we have individual level data available, yes, which is the primary. Yes, trying to make sure that we have individual level data available, which is the primary goal of um, the Minister of Education back in the Gambia of getting into this project. But as we were developing and designing um, this specific project, there were some other urgent issues that needed some attention. And um, that shows the flexibility of the HIS to, to respond to some specific needs, to some specific situations, as you know, we are designing and developing the systems for you know, a, a bigger purpose. So, and one of these innovations is um, the daily attendance systems. And um, the reason why it's important is because generally in education, um, Education service delivery, the most important thing that the minister can do is to provide input into the school systems. And the most important input in the school system is the teachers. And uh, monitoring whether these teachers are actually in school and whether they are giving attention to the kids as required is definitely crucial in making sure that, you know, we monitor and try to understand um, where, you know, the performance or lapses are coming from. Uh, so that's, um, I am going to take you through some of the the past experiences um, from in, in a sort of a story um, way so that we can understand, um, you know, the, where we are coming from, what kind of challenges we are having and how the HISO has been so uh, pivotal in, in helping solve that. So at the very beginning, you know, as with many, you know, innovations, we always start with paper, paper, paper. So paper from the school, uh, you know, aggregated, then paper to, to the cluster monitor at the sub national level sub-regional level, then it goes to the regional level where it is aggregated and then analyzed. So, but this uh, process in the first instance, it takes three months, a whole term for the attendance to be aggregated and then, you know, um, analyzed at the regional level and then for the region to take action. Because attendance data is for regional data and they are the ones that, you know, for easy action to go back and make sure that it is uh, recorded. But it's three months too late and usually there's no feedback that goes back to the schools most importantly. So the schools themselves have to do their own analysis if they want to make use of uh, the data. And it's resource intensive because, you know, um, there's a lot of going through and back to the foods. And because everyone is doing their own analysis, it's sort of a duplication of resources at the very beginning. Then um, the second um, version of this attendance system, the second improvement is still pre-DHIS2, but it shows um, how flexible the HIS2 can leverage the existing structures and build upon what is already found in the country instead of revamping you know, um, systems or you know, structures that are found there. And um, one of the innovations that we did before it was trying to introduce what we call um, a, a phone-based uh, system. This is where we try to remove the middlemen. Uh, the schools, we are given a simple phone and you know, uh, we connected this simple for using, you know, tele not um, relationship with the network agents, with the telecommunication companies to create what we call a close user group between the school. So every school has a theme that was given and they would put in the form. So there's a different multiple versions of this specific innovation because first it started with the schools had to call directly to the regional office and then the regional office would, would enter the data. But it was difficult because you would call sometimes network issues or no one is there at the desk to, re to receive it. It requires somebody to be there every time. Then, you know, we, we moved to sending SMS. Then that guy that was only receiving end of the SMS also found it very difficult to get all the messages. Sometimes he skipped, sometimes he didn't skip. Then we decided to go to a web-based solution where, you know, using a toll-free um, line, you know, at uh, uh, 445. The, the, the SMSs are now sent via SMS to the network agent, to the uh, network operator, and they would send that to a public portal where we would, you know, then download, you know, try to analyze and then 
um, say are back to the regions. But two things were a problem in, in that scenario. One, the schools, because we removed the region now from the operation, so the ownership was totally, totally dead. It became a problem of the ministry now, not the region. So the regions don't feel any more responsible because the data is coming from the schools direct to the ministry as they feel. And the ministry also had this added responsibility to, you know, bring out the data and then uh, clean it because the SMS was based on a strict format that the schools have to send. And there are a lot of data quality issues with those uh, strict formats. Then because of these challenges, it was not very efficient. So, and it takes us time to do this analysis and, and um, share back with the schools. Then we had the third phase where, you know, DHIS2 came in to help solve some of this problem. So the first thing that was done was at that moment instant, the school, the ministry procured um, tablets, as you can see in the first um, slide that was shared. In this one's tablets that we are shared with the with the schools. Now these tablets, the purpose was um, with uh, with the help of um, DHS as a platform in, and you know our partners with the Swiss and Central Africa, we design an application that is so, that is going to help the schools in formatting this this data um, uh, accurately, and then compose send that SMS to the network agent in the same you know way that it, the SMS was going. And then when it goes to the SMS agent, instead of going to our web portal, now it goes into DHIS2, which gives us instant analysis. And then the regions themselves, you know, are easily being brought back because we've given them access to this system and they are able to use the instant analysis that they have found in this, in this um, um, new system. So they have, you know, leveraged the existing infrastructures, now instant analysis and the pre-formatted SMS helped us with, you know, trying to, um, deal with the quality issues that we had at the, at the uh, starting. But there were some little issues also with this first version because uh, there was, because you are sending an application for the signing up at the first time, there was little internet that was required at, at the beginning. So the schools, you know, um, but just it was just for configuration. So during the training, we'll go and con um, configure um, the mobile phones of most of the schools, then they will set up, then we would go. But once if they log out of the application, it becomes a problem for them to log back in without internet. And you know, with rural population, it's not easy to, to monitor internet. And there was also this monitoring bit and support that was missing. missing. And uh, this became very clear when COVID came because immediately after this innovation was brought, you know, COVID came and the school stopped reporting. And uh, because schools were starting to alternate things, we are confusion, attendance was the last thing on people's mind. So they were trying to see if we can have classes in the first instance. So then um, after, after COVID to resume became a problem. We were somewhere saying, oh, I'm sending, somewhere saying having issues, somewhere not doing it the right way. So you, it was difficult to know how to support them, what challenges they were having and stuff. And this is why, you know, last year from the um, uh, mid of 2022, we implemented the third version of this um, DHIS2 um, system where for the first time, even before the data left the telephones of these schools, um, of the head teachers, the telephones of the head teachers in these schools, they were able to visualize and analyze the data themselves. That was something that was not possible at the moment by using the local data that's already there, even before it is sent. So whether there's network, whether we don't know uh, there's a network or not, the data that is shared is stored locally, and then they have instant analysis that you know the schools can start using uh, already. And um this time we tried to, uh, it was totally offline. So the configuration, you know, issues were removed and the, the school information was also sent via the SMS, which is still totally free for the schools. The SMS doesn't cost anything to the, to the schools. So, and then the inbuilt analytics that allows um, them to, to, to do that. Now on the other side, we made it possible for, for the regional offices to directly monitor the attendance as it's coming. So not only, um, whether the data is coming or not, what live analysis has is coming. And this dashboard that you are seeing that we've created is filterable to the individual schools. So using this dashboard, every school that is sending attendance data and uh, can use this account that we have already created and shared with all the schools in the country to, you know, add to share and visualize their data once they have access to the internet or they have access to, the, to these resources. So this is another way of them getting access to the data and, and be using it. Then in, um, there was this log application that was also designed as part of this package, you know, I'm using also tools from DHIS2 
to see the issues that the schools are trying to send. If someone that is sending data from, you know, um, a, a, a wrong number or they are using a wrong format or, you know, you know, the data that they are importing is wrong or, you know, whether, you know, it's overriding the previous data that you have sent. So these are the issues that we've, um, we have developed. And this is all controlled, not at the national level, but at the regional level because the regional planning officers are the ones that have been given full responsibility of having this system managing it and making sure that the ownership now is fully back in control of the region because the ministry usually don't have much um, to do with this attendance. So this is just showing how we use the maps uh, at the regional level to share um, the coverage of the attendance systems, the ones that are sending attendance and the ones that are not understanding, and then they can easily spot out you know, the ones um, and how to help them. And then we have um, um, also a list based on the schools uh, that allows them to not only know which schools are sending, but also at what level of, you know, they are having issues in terms of um, um, sending attendance, uh, in terms of reporting uh, to, to, to be able to help them um, um, solve this. So, and the next version, as we are seeing, you know, with the dashboard and all that, the schools are still having challenges in using this um, um, system because of the uh, internet that is required mostly. So we are trying to leverage this existing infrastructure, you know, going forward to have something based on the telephone numbers and the CUGs that the schools have to build a, what, a VPN system that is going to allow, you know, the schools to access this DHI2 platform anywhere from any instance and they'll be able to visualize this as, you know, frequently as possible at no cost at all to them. So this is what we, we have um, been discussing. And um, um, I'm very open to any questions that you have on the technicalities or on some of the um, issues. But the good thing is, at the moment, we have, uh, uh, I don't know whether we can call him a region of excellence, but one of these regions has really taken this by, by, by the horn and have been, you know, um, sharing in their global pl uh, platforms, you know, attendance issues, attendance um, um, uh, solutions, problems, and, you know, everyone um, have been working together to help solve each other's problems, especially the schools that are having issues and stuff. So um, thank you very much for the attention. Um, I'm open to the questions. Yes, that's a lot. Thank you so much, CD. And also to mention that that region isn't right in the city center, right? I think that's uh, pretty powerful all the way out. So thank you so much for that. So for this session, um, usually what DHIS2 does is we have abstracts that are submitted. So folks will take the time to think through a case study, think through a use case, something they want to present and submit that formally for, for it to, to have a moment to be in one of the sessions. <clears throat> so I'm really, really um, happy to share that we received an abstract from um, a team uh, in Uganda. It was the Ministry of uh, Education and Sports, Basic Education Department, a member from that team. Uh, Save the Children, HISP Uganda. Um, and I think that is all. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone else. And they would like to share a little bit more about some of the work they've been trying to do of not just decentralizing to the district level, but trying to take one of the unique innovations that came from the district level one step further to see how uh, the school can actually benefit from that data that's being collected at the district level. So without further ado, people, um, a, a Ronald, um, who's online now, I'm just checking that you can hear us and that we can hear you. If you don't mind. Um... Ronald, are you able to hear us? I see that you are not muted. I'm just checking if we are going to if not, we can take a pause and we can move to. Okay. Okay. Are you able to get um, Alfredo's presentation up?
sorry, Alfredo, putting you on the spot on a different time. Are you able to help us by coming up and presenting just the, yes, that would be great. So we'll come back to Uganda very soon. Sorry for that, Ronald. We'll chat to you to make sure that we can get the audio working. And then I'd like to take the opportunity now to introduce you to Alfredo, um, Senior Lead Developer at Cell Digitus, um, who has been working to support not just the Mozambique implementation um, in education, but also a lot of innovations when it comes to applications that are needed for the global team. So many of the applications you've been working on have been um, important for the work done in the Gambia, but also for many other countries. So thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Hi, everyone. So I will be sharing uh, the experience from Mozambique uh, regarding to the uh, local innovation development and implementation on the education sector. So in Mozambique, we are working uh, with uh, the government, uh, the Minister of Education, in order to implement the education management information system. And as a strategy, we started uh, from two provinces, Nampula and Sambeza province. And there we managed to perform uh, a set of activities with a main goal to implement a sustainable, flexible, and integrated uh, education management uh, information system. And to reach this goal, <coughs> we, we designed some uh, implementation strategies. We did uh, a system evaluation, understanding what uh, was uh, in place, how the data is being collected, and how it's, it's flowing uh, to, to the national level. We also checked on this process the needs about what the, the government at uh, national, province, district, and school level need in order to, to, to have a data with, with good quality and ready to be used. Uh, and after those two steps, we started the system development. And basically, it was a process of uh, converting uh in a structured way the paper based uh, tools that they have uh in place uh to to, to the uh, system and for that we did uh initially we did some aggregated uh, data entry forms to collect the sensors and other tools that they had at school level uh and it, it was followed by the validation and testing and we did it gradually making sure that they are part of the development process uh, having some weekly meetings to validate and, and, and making sure that the system fits on what they want to do and the output that they want to have uh, from the system. Assuming that was there uh, and working system, uh, a Duke start or start a Duke, depending on where we are, we are, we are calling it from, uh, one of the work that we, we did was this uh, historical data import. So we worked with the, uh, these two uh, province director in order to move to migrate the data that is uh, stored on this system to the uh, uh, DHS2 platform. And based on that, we managed to, to, to create uh, a great dashboards with all uh, core indicators and everything that they want uh, uh, to do at the national uh, uh, level. And also not, 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 not only at national level, but also at, at province and, and, and district level. Uh, and with this implementation process, I, at some moment was there need to move a bit down to the individual uh, level data because everyone is expecting uh, uh, to deal with individual level data. Unfortunately, I cannot say I can say unfortunately or not necessary, but at the education side, differently from the health uh, sector, they are most used to deal with individual uh, level data, even if it's a paper based. For them, it's more relevant to have the single line for each student. What's the big difference for the health sector? So it was something new for us because everyone is expecting our individual level data to check the teacher attendance, attendance and effectiveness, to check the student attendance daily, and also to implement some uh, social uh, uh, related uh, uh, initiatives. And one of them is this initiative called She Belongs uh, to School that was implemented to uh, guarantee that uh, the young girls, uh, the young human, girls and, uh, are, are retained at school and are not going out for some uh, social uh, 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 reasons. And because of that, I uh, started uh, a series of apps development, not only to fit this uh, uh, use case, 
but also the other use case that were coming from the different uh, implementations. So was there, uh, the team started working on uh, some dedicated applications for data capture. So we, we first we tried to do, we did some prototypes in order to go to the field, test, understand what is the user feedback. And now we are working uh, in order to have a more solid apps that will uh, make sure that we have the users taking, for example, attendance in a more uh, flexible and interactive way. So this is a, a, a screenshot <coughs> for, 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 for what uh, is, 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 is on place and we are planning to do for the attendance. So you can see here in the same page, you can have a summary of what was uh, is happening during the week. You can take a uh, single attendance, view list events, and take also uh, bulk attendance if you want to import uh, uh, data. You have here another screenshot uh, from the marks perspective. So you can have the list of all students. And for each term, you can take uh, uh, the marks. And in the education, something that is very common is this possibility of doing bulk promotion. So at the end of the year, you want to move uh, 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 the, the students for one grade to a different one. So you, 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 you don't have to do it one by one. You can select those that first and pass them to the next level. And those that are going to remain the same grade, you can keep the, them. So the idea here is to work together with the different uh, his uh, and the Minister of Education in order to build these uh, education apps uh, suite in order to improve the data collection and 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 uh, today during the expert launch, we'll be uh, doing some demo on the Android app to take attendance and 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 etc. Uh, so I think I will I will stop here just to to yeah to save time. Okay, thank you. Thank you Thank you. Audio back. And Alfred, I'm so glad that you had that opportunity to present. And also, um, it's a pity we couldn't hear about the perspectives from Mozambique, because I think there's some very unique uh, perspectives there. So I hope we can upload your presentation to the agenda afterwards so that people can have um, access. Yeah. Uh, now it will be Ronald Nyaz Nya Nyanzi from Save uh, the Children. Hi, Ronald. Can uh, you hear us and can we hear yes, you? Yes, I can get you, Sophia. Hi, oh, Sophia. Hello. Please. Sorry for that. Uh, we had a savior come in to support. Um, yeah. I'm now going to have to drop this presentation, Grant, and go over to Ronald's. But Ronald, um, really such a pleasure. Thank you for your patience. Um, Please feel free, whilst we get your presentation up for you, just to introduce yourself and uh, maybe kick us off. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sophia and Tim. Uh, my name is Ronald Nyanzi, uh, working as information, the information management coordinator with Save the Children uh, on the uh, DHS for Education project in collaboration with ISP Uganda and Minister of Education and Sports. Uh, our, our presentation is about uh, enhancing uh, data use at the grassroots. Uh, we are looking at schools and communities through the school status report, uh, looking at a case study of schools in Uganda. Uh, please, can we go to the next, uh, next slide? Uh, the background in the education sector is that uh, uh, education has or generates large volume and variety of data. Uh, education data is quite complex. And this data is picked from our uh, schools and institutions, uh, which are the primary source of this data. Uh, whereas uh, we have most of the education management information systems provide limited owner feedback to these schools. Uh, so this solution has been uh, partly worked on uh, through DHIS2 for education. Uh, if I'm to give you a snapshot of DHIS for Education in Uganda, uh, uh, it's being operation, it's operationalized in four districts. Please, can we, uh, uh, can we go? okay, yes. Uh, four districts, and in this case, uh, particularly a term, the term late tool was rolled out in 2022, that is last year. Uh, you can see the, the districts that have been highlighted. 
And uh, one of the quick gains is that we, we've uh, managed to have automated feedback to schools through the school status report, uh, which I'll be uh, defining as we move on. Uh, next, please. Uh, so basically, we, uh, a lot has been done around the area of education with DHS in Uganda. I'll just go through uh, some of the things that have been achieved. Uh, despite us being uh, uh, implementing the tablet tool uh, in for only four districts, uh, there are national data use cases. For example, uh, one of for the COVID-19 school-based surveillance, uh, national teacher uh, data call. Uh, this was as a result of, uh, uh, of course, after COVID, most of we know most of the teachers or the teachers were largely affected and uh, during COVID, and uh, government. I uh, wanted to know the number of uh, teachers in private schools to be able to use partners and support them, uh, of which DHS2 was handy uh, to uh, get this information. Of course, there are also cross-sectorial uh, 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 linkages that, that we have seen under DHS2 with education, under education and health, uh, cross-sectorial synergies, that is vaccination campaign, the HP, HPV vaccination and underwarming, so uh, uh, you can also see the school-based uh, surveillance, real-time dashboard, and smart screen uh, in, in the Minister of, under Minister of Education. Uh, but uh, a lot has been done in the, uh, with DHIS2, though uh, for today I will concentrate on the integrated TAMLE tool because uh, the report builds from the TAMLE tool. Uh, what were the objectives of, of developing this tool and implementing it? One. Of course, there was a, ch a challenge of uh, uh, data, and uh, of course, we one of the objectives was to provide routine data to the districts and Minister of Education for evidence-based planning and reporting, uh, promote provision of feedback to school through the school status reports, uh, pilot uh, cost-effective data collection through the web and Android data entry process at school level, also support continuous capacity building of education system, education staff on system system use, and again promote data quality through continuous data reviews and data use workshops. Uh, basically, you realize that all this to happen, the schools must submit data because if the schools don't submit data, the minister will not the minister and the districts will not have the data to use. So as we support uh, the larger local governments to use this data there is need to support schools or to motivate them to uh, give us this data, of which one of the motivations should be uh, schools being in position to use this data. Uh, next. So what is the school status report in this regard? Uh, in the Ugandan case, uh, uh, this is just a dashboard for school readers and administrators and other stakeholders to basically assess school's performance to identify areas of improvement, also to make data-driven decisions at school level. So basically, this is a simple dashboard in DHIS2 uh, that uh, is automated. When the school submits data, uh, then that school should be able to view, uh, uh, to view their report on, of course, uh, on, on uh, uh, given, given the login credentials. So basically, that's the school status report. How did we come to this? Of course, uh, this uh, we went through a process, and one of the first steps we had was to uh, have a field visit to schools to assess the data management and these practices. Uh, in Uganda, of course, we had uh, uh, the census tools uh, that uh, was was being used to collect uh data for to guide minister of planning and decision making though this was a little bit annual and it would take a lot of time so uh from uh, from that of course uh the 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 user department departments felt that they they didn't have uh, uh this routine that they needed routine data but thinking beyond the user department we also felt that for uh, for the schools to use this data we need to consult them to see how much or find out how much of this data uh, is, uh, uh, is used at school or which kind of data is used at school. So we had field visits to schools to assess data management and use practices. 
uh, then we're going to uh, we identified identification of key data needs at school level. Uh, then through assessing the possible data use instances at school level. Uh, for as integrating data needs into the terminal reporting tool. Of course, after the user departments providing uh, their needs, we also integrated the school uh, needs. Then we also had the consultation workshop on appropriateness of the tool for schools. Uh, we had situations whereby some of the data that was being pushed by the uh, user departments was could not be practically collected at school. So some of those instances came up and uh, uh, of course, they helped us, these engagements helped us to, to fine tune the tool so that we can be able to collect whatever data that we needed. Uh, then uh, uh, finally, we consult uh, consultatively designed the school status report uh, basing on the needs that were available at the moment. Next. Uh, thank, uh, 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 the other thing is, uh, of course, when you talk of a school status report, by definition, this is a too big. And uh, uh, having clarified that uh, 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 we have a complex, uh, or the education data is a little bit complex, we couldn't represent any, each and everything on this dashboard. So basically, some of the dashboards that we picked from the Tamlet tool, so some of the indicators that we picked from the Tamlet tool uh, were enrollment. Of course, uh, this uh, this aggregated by class, gender, and special needs category. Uh, then learners and teachers attendance. Uh, efficiency ratios. Here we are looking at people teacher ratio, people stance ratio, people textbook ratio. Uh, we also looked at number of learners having meals at school, uh, because that is uh, uh, one of the drivers of learners to school. And sometimes it's in most of the schools, it's leading to learners dropping out of school because they are not receiving meals. Uh, we also looked at inclusivity, where here we look at number of classrooms with access to ramps, and also number of learners leaving school. In this case, uh, the minister already ha uh, they have uh, a number of reasons that uh, have been proved uh, to cater for uh, learners dropouts. And uh, these are the reasons we based on also to, uh, to, to these are the reasons we based, based on also to uh, develop uh, the school uh, status report under uh, indicator five. So basically, uh, that was all for the indicators. Then, Sorry, uh, Ronald, I might seem like I'm pushing you along, but we have something you missed um, because the Zoom link was giving you trouble was that there is a national alarm going off in Norway and it's going off in about 20 minutes so okay, we, okay. we might just uh, speed up a tiny bit so that okay. we can make sure his uh, Indonesia has time to speak so uh, sorry okay. thank you okay. what what has worked well uh, one uh, automated school status re uh, reports following submission of template data uh, these have talked about it that uh, most of these schools when they submit data they are able to get feedback uh, automatically. Uh, then uh, 214 school administrators have been trained on data retrieval and use. Then some schools have also used school status reports to improve on their terminal work plans. So this is something that, as you can see, uh, uh, a team of uh, school administrators was uh, brainstorming on how to develop a terminal work plan based on the school status report. Uh, next, okay. Uh, then uh, the other is uh, schools have registered more learners receiving meals following interventions from the school status report. Uh, we have also had structures transformed to accommodate learners with special needs. Uh, uh, ultimately, school administrators have been trained to enter data at school level using both the web-based and Android platforms, as you can see. Uh, basically, uh, of course, people might uh, not see the beauty of this, but uh, in Uganda, we have districts that have, have over a thousand schools. So if you have one district data entrant uh, having to enter those are thousand forms, sometimes it's challenging. So that's why uh, we also need to promote uh, data entry at school level for schools that have the capacity and resources. Next. 
what are the challenges? Uh, one of the challenges uh, we've had is the data literacy gap among school administrators. Uh, definitely, this is uh, this is evident. Uh, so, some can, uh, of course, some don't have even the basic skills of uh, browsing through a dashboard, and uh, uh, some are not willing to learn. So uh, we have limited capacity in ICT. The digital divide among schools. Uh, digital divide among schools. We have schools in Uganda that even have resources to empl employ an IT expert as a school, but also we have those that even cannot afford a laptop or a desktop. So retirement phobia, uh, the category of school administrators we deal with in Uganda, especially for government schools, are approaching retirement age. And they look at some of these uh, things as uh, information overload. After all, they are going to retire. So they are not willing to take in uh, uh, some of these new developments. Then resource constraints, including inadequate funds to facilitate my, my stakeholder engagements and infrastructure challenges. Next. Thanks, uh, recommendations. Ronald. So maybe we can say, if it's okay with you, we can maybe just, um, if you could highlight for us the key kind of thoughts throughout these recommendations, and then we can move it on to HISP Indonesia. Okay. Thank uh, you. Recommendations. Uh, one, uh, one of the recommendations is local governments to blend uh, that education, education data awareness sessions in their meetings with school administrators. Of course, uh, the challenge is that uh, some people are, uh, can't even, uh, uh, can't, can't even uh, uh, define or they don't know the minimum requirements for maybe the number of learners that are expected in a classroom. So these are things that can be uh, brainstormed, uh, brainstormed in these meetings. Then training institutions for school administrators to integrate ICT and data literacy modules in their curriculum. So we think this will be helpful if universities take it on and we have uh, data literate as school administrators. Uh, then also there's building a hub of data use champions at school level who will ultimately mentor other key stakeholders into the best practices. Uh, then also uh, design of low cost methodologies to promote mass stakeholder engagements for timely decision making. Thank you so much, Ronald. Thank, Thank, you. You, Thank you very much. Thanks for your Thank time you. and apologies for Sophia rushing you. No, no, no. Thank you <laughs> Thank so you, much. Sophia. Yeah. Great, so then I, I welcome Poppy to the stage here. We're lucky to have you here in person. Uh, very exciting new use case. And whilst Poppy is getting herself ready here, if everyone online and in the room can just stretch very quickly, just stretch your bodies up and do a little side to side. You can get up more. Okay, right. You have our full attention, so thank you. And if, um, if the alarm's about to go off, you'll see my face, yeah, okay. Okay, well, hello everyone. I am Poppy Melanie from Indonesia. Here I'd like to share about the AGIS2 expansion implementation in Indonesia. Since we have concern to the health sector, uh, now we can uh, see how the AGIS2 have a role on the education sector. Here we'd like to see uh, the AC Kulaki, which means that let's go to school. Uh, yeah, developed to discover the socioeconomic landscape. Uh, by the way, it's a little bit colder here. <laughs> okay. Um, and here is uh, the condition of our city. But uh, before we are going to discuss and then know about the demographical and geographic condition in Indonesia, we'd like to have the point here. We are not going to uh, discuss how DHIS2 become a learning platform, but how DHIS2 support and provide the uh, education environment in Indonesia, especially in Makassar city. Here is uh, Makassar as the capital of South Sulawesi and the central activities there, where the industrial and government activities uh, happen there. And of course, it becomes the center or role model for the education and health services. This is the point. You can say that Makassar as the face 
of uh, South Sulawesi or even the Celebes or South Island, uh, Sulawesi Island. With the population in 2021, it reached up to 1.1 million. Here is the issue come up from the economic sector. We know that and we can see that only around 170,000 total area with the 9,900 per kilometer population density with uneven distributed wealth for the economic situation. We know when there are an unbalancing in the economic situation, it will affect another sectors, include education. All right. And here is the condition. And I can say that it's not only on uh, 2021 and up to 2022, but in the last five years, more than 2,500 uh, students drop out. And it become a concern from the local government how to improve and enhance. And as we know that the human resource become the key of a place to uh, grow up and even, even to enhance their condition. And yeah, here in the coordination with the Regional Development Planning Research and Development Agency, or we called by BAPEDA, before we have developed and used the HIS2 to integrate the multi-sectoral data, but it's uh, aggregate data best. But today, we use the Isekulaki um, for develop and track all of the Makassar citizens from age 7 to 18, and when students who drop out from school and their social status. And of course, this will support the government to create a strategy on budgeting, of course, the planning in the city itself. Let's we uh, see how the success story. And then um, here is the app development. If we are talking about the system development, and we are going to say that in 2020, uh, 22, we are starting. Uh, we are starting to develop this app. We can see how it's not that difficult to develop the system. We have seven days whole to um, develop the system, I mean, it's until it's ready to use by the users. The main point here, how we can uh, engage or giving the trust with the government so that in the three, uh, three days uh, consignment, we can focus to talk with them about the app, uh, design to the app development. And the second day, we agreed what are the variables or metadata that will be included system. And then the uh, last but not least is about the capacity building itself. If we are going to talk about the sustainability and the continuity of the system use in the field. We have to give up concentrated capacity building too, because most of the cases in the field is um, there are in the capacity building uh, happen there so that the user uh, depend to an administrator. And then when the people move, so the system moved or stopped there, so that we have concern to uh, the capacity buildings. And then we are uh, we were having four day system development on uh, available the instance and then configured the metadata itself and of course uh, set up the users and, and administrator on the system till we have two kind of application there is a web based app and android best uh, we develop into two kind of applications to uh, discover on to answer all of the geographical burden or challenges in the field okay here is the uh, Kolaki, the HIS2 Android, and these are the variables in the systems when, where we have uh, identified and of course detailed the Zazel status and economical uh, status from each family there. We have identified how the educational facility and of course the government support so that then the stakeholders could 
identify which uh, which uh, family or which part of region that couldn't access to the education um, facilities too. And of course, uh, we have the web uh, application that is used by the data managers and of course for the stakeholders to see how the data has input to the system and to take a decision from the data input. And here, the all of the stakeholders can even know how the educational status of family members, all of the family members. And here we can give a point to the number of students at risk of the dropping out based on the Societal uh, capacity that uh, or economic uh, status that they have. Okay, on operating this system or this application, we have identified that three main actors that is uh, very important to uh, support on uh, to support on producing the good data. The first is data advisor. That is, uh, we have around 152 uh, fillets so that around 152 officers too that collect the data at the village data and conduct the survey to the citizen there. And of course the data administrator at the sub-district level to verify so that we can have the data guarantee there. And then Last uh, but not least, we have the data managers at district level that is responsible to manage the data itself so that the stakeholders or the related parties can use the data as well. Okay. Yeah, it's just like a basic thing on the information cycle, and this is what happened to with the um, easy Kolaki, where we have. Uh, data officer and the collection and then process and analysis with the data administrator. And here, the most important thing is how the data can be used by the stakeholders in order that we want to decrease the number of the dropout student in Makassar City. Yes, there, these are some uh, things that can be done by the government since uh, they can use the data from uh, Kolaki. Here it is. We can see before uh, the HIS2 implementation in uh, Makassar City started in 2022. And then before that, we can see there is high numbers of uh, dropout students in Makassar. And when we implement the DHIS2, it, it is a significant decrease numbers of dropout students in the field at about more than 30%. And as you can see, this is uh, what article said when the local government, the local government uh, can give or can take the best decision, like giving the um, scholarship to the student in the field. And it adds around 3,000 3, scholarship and it raised uh, amount about 200 from the last year. And how it can be said that we can have a successful uh, story for the ESC uh, Kolaki DHIS2 implementation. The first, actually before, Makassar City has uh, developed the system for the uh, right side. But then there are many caps and then uh, trouble there where they have to depend to an administrator and then need to be extract here from the SAPBM ATS, they have to extract the data and then collect it and then manage it where they have to report at um, 25 uh, each month. 
but then it would be delayed because they have to um, manage it or process it again. And then no user hierarchy and no capacity building. So that when the system and the administrator is moving, the system is stopped. So that here is a calculate developed with the easy access, so flexible, I mean, flexible, how to uh, develop the metadata and configure the metadata as they need uh, in the field. And of course, we can uh, serve the quick reporting and analysis and each user has specific role. These are the things and then main focus uh, from the users, uh, the local government too, where they have like the stakeholder, they can directly access the dashboard or the data that they need and the data officer is only to data entry app and uh, all of the main users uh, has their has specific role so that uh, the, the data can be managed well and we of course giving the concern to the capacity building so we can consider the sustainability and here is the key on the capacity building we conduct so all of the actors in the development of the use or the system can know well how to use it. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. I feel um, one thing we've been saying is that the more apps start to come around, we need to bring our brains and heads together to make sure that any any unique new apps we can start thinking together as a team so that they, we can think about sustainability maintenance of these apps etc we've gone off with a bang as promised there goes the alarm so thank you to everyone joining online we will um, share the slides <laughs>